نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, bestow his mercy and his blessings upon this majlis this gathering especially since our niyyah or our intention is to begin to access if not at an at a scholarly level but at a level that each believer needs and should have to access the works and the writings of one of Islam's greatest scholars and when we say scholars ulama i don't mean just academically or intellectually or ilmi but i also mean from the point of view of piety righteousness and god fearingness that is to say the person whose works we're going to begin to access today is one of the ulama ar rabbaniyun or ulama amilun those lordly scholars those scholars who allah gave tawfiq blessings to act by their knowledge a scholar who was versed in the inward and the outward sciences of Islam so much so that ajma uh, ulama ittafaqu alayh that the the scholars united upon his imamship or imamhood and that is the scholar uh, imam yahya ibn sharaf an nawawi rahmatullahi alayh imam an nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala and we're looking at his book or collection of 40 or 40 hadith 40 hadiths that he collected um and he wasn't the only one who collected 40 hadiths for this ummah hundreds of years before him there were hundreds of scholars who wrote a book called uh, 40 or 40 40 hadiths and even after him there were hundreds of scholars who have written books collecting 40 hadiths on various topics or subject matters in Islam but none has reached the level the acceptance the popularity the significance the love that this particular collection of 40 hadith has received from lay people from lay people to scholars alike in this ummah since the time imam nawawi rahmatullah alayhi wrote it imam nawawi very briefly was a shafi'i faqih a shafi'i scholar born in the year 631 hijra but he didn't live very long he only lived, lived about 50, 50, 55 odd years okay uh, he died or, or, or less than that in fact about between 45 to 50, 50 odd years 631 he died 676 so if we do the quick calculation 31 41 51 61 71 that's only about 45 years okay subhanallah in, in and in one sense you get to your prime at around about 40 so this imam rahmatullah alayhi passes away more or less as he begins to reach his the beginning of his prime and yet within 45 years or less than that because he wasn't writing at the age of you know 6 months or 8 months but he was writing at an incredibly young age he was a shafi'i scholar but also he was a great hadith master hafizul hadith and he was known particularly for his taqwa and wara his piety and scrupulousness and his god fearingness in the way how he would gently but courageously advise the kings and the, the rulers and the wulatul umur the people in authority of his time not shouting at them not cursing them because that's not the way of the sunnah but gently advising them and not buckling under political pressure sometimes his counsels were accepted and other times they weren't but in 45 years from the time of birth to the time of death rahmatullah alayhi I want to just explain what the scholars think about Imam Nawawi. Not just the Shafi'i scholars, limited to just the school of the Madhab, but across the board. His collection of 40 Hadith Nawawi 
has become the most famous and accepted. His book, Riyadh Salihin, The Gardens of the Righteous, which is a book about piety, uh, good conduct, spirituality, and some basic regulations, ahkam for Muslims. Don't have pictures in your house, don't deal in riba, don't steal, don't cheat. As well as the matter of the heart, fear Allah, love Allah, have trust in Allah, as well as social matters, be kind to parents, look after the needy and the orphans, as well as enjoying the good, forbidden, evil. These, this Riyadh Salihin, this collection of hadiths primarily, is probably one of the most accepted books within the Muslim world and Muslim scholarship from the time Imam Noah we wrote it. Just 250 odd short chapters. Starts with a chapter heading, chapter on niyyah and ikhlas, sincerity and, and uh, good intentions. Brings four or five verses to show the importance of intentions and sincerity. And then he'll give five or six or ten hadiths about the subject. And he'll do that for the rest of the 250 subjects. And that book has become accepted in the hearts of the scholars and the lay people alike across the board from the Ummah since the 7th century when he wrote it. Okay. Step up a bit. If anyone wants to study Imam Muslim Sahih, Sahih Muslim, at an ilmi academic level, it is impossible to pass the commentary, to pass by the commentary of Imam, uh, Imam Nawawi, which he wrote on Sahih Muslim. Imam Nawawi's Sharh on Sahih Muslim is the most famous commentary on Sahih Muslim. And it's just impossible to study that text, that book, Sahih Muslim, without accessing Imam Nawawi's commentary. It has become the most accepted commentary since he wrote it. Remember, we're talking about a pastor who died at the age of 45. Okay? If one was studying Shafi Fiqh at a really high level, at a kind of a level of being a mujtahid, or a, at least a murajjah, someone who can weigh up in the school the, 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 uh, the, the, the different levels or weights of the legal rulings. It's impossible to study Shafi Fiqh, even now I suspect, even at some basic level, without accessing Imam Nawawi's writings in Shafi Fiqh, because he was, an, he was a master in that field. Whether it's the Sharhul Muhaddab in Shafi Fiqh, which runs into, in the modern print, about 18 volumes. Or other books in Shafi Fiqh, which uh, one of them are, is in 10 volumes, um, Minhaj al-Talibin. Whether it's a book on, uh, on the rare Arabic words in hadiths, okay, which is in three or four volumes. Whether it's Riyadh al-Salihin, whether it's Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith. All of the books he wrote, which is really amazing, have all become not just accepted by the scholars, but they have been considered to be gems and milestones in the subject matter that he wrote. And he wrote so much, and he passed away at 45 years old. Okay, so even if we say he started writing at a, 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 a beautiful young age of say 20, which is incredibly young to write at, let's just assume he did, because he was learning from, from the cradle anyway. 20 to 45, that's only 25 years. In a quarter of a century, to write so much but not just so much, because there are other scholars. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahmatullahi says about himself, he's one of the, he's, the, he's called the Imam al-Mufassirun, the Imam of all the scholars of Tafsir, okay, who died in the year 310 or 311 Hijri, 300 years before, before Imam Nawawi was even born. Ibn Jarir says about himself, al-Tabari says about himself, on average I was writing between, uh, just from the top like that, okay, between uh, 30 to 100 pages a day. And he said, my tafsir, Tabari, which when he wrote it, you know, uh, it ran into about uh, 70, 80 volumes because you're talking about handwriting in modern print, uh, in small writing, maybe half the size of this writing. You can get it down to about 18 volumes, tafsir, Tabari, okay. Uh, he said, I would have kind of continued writing it, but I feared that if I write it to how I wanted it, not even the best of the students would have been able to read it. Okay, and his tarikh tabari, his history of the world, he says the same thing. Had I wished, I could have made this book much larger than it is. At the moment, it runs into 20 volumes. But I feared that not even the best of the students would be able to, <laughs> to access it after a while. So it's not that Imam Nawawi has written the most. Imam Tabari has clearly written more than him. 
But he's written so much in such a short time with qubuliya, with acceptability from Allah in the ummah. Allah's qubul for someone's work or amal is really what counts. That Allah's placed love of Imam Nawawi's works in the heart of not just the Shafi'i scholars and ulama, but the Hanafi, the Hanbali, the Maliki ulama, the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah across the board. And not just one work, it would be brilliant just to have one amazing piece of work. And that's normally you find a scholar will have one amazing piece of work or one work, which, he may have many amazing pieces of work, but one which is really, is captivated the scholars. But to have all of your works that have captivated all of the scholars and much of the lay people alike, subhanAllah, then we are dealing with someone whom clearly in his lifetime, rahmatullah Allah Jalla wa ala blessed and gave great barakah to. Okay. And the second thing is, our scholars have said that when we wish to begin to access in a more formal way, in a more instructive way, the sunnah of Al-Mustafa, the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and we want to start learning simply, but with the right foundations, it's almost nearly all of the ulama tend to suggest. Imam Nawawi's Arba'een, 40 hadith, should be the starting point of our learning the knowledge of the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, in, the, in the sense of becoming a student of knowledge, a talib al ilm. Of course, for the lay pass, for the farmer who's working there and the baker who's working there and the candlestick maker, they, don't, they can just access the knowledge of Islam from, from khutbahs or whatever. But in a more formal way, so that we have step-by-step -step learning, starting with the so small simple things and working our way up to the, little, the more difficult things, starting with, you know, in, in my time, the, uh, the GCSEs were split up. GCSEs were actually split up, okay, into CSEs and to O-levels, okay? And then they were combined somewhere along the line in late 80s, 90s to just GCSEs. C CSEs were people who, uh, I, I had kind of friends who lived on my housing estate, who out of the 250 years or more of school in a year, they probably attended two and a half days of school. And they would be people who would either get one CSE or no CSE. Okay? And then you'd get those who went on to do A-levels, they would get, a, they would get um, six O-levels or seven O-levels. Okay? And then you had those in the middle. This is like a CSE text, a really basic text. Okay, and Imam Nawawi says, people before me have written hadith, 40 hadith on various subjects, 40 hadith on kindness to parents, 40 hadith on prayer, 40 hadith about Jannah, 40 hadith about good character, 40 hadith about jihad, 40 hadith about etiquettes of eating. But he says in the introduction of, uh, of, of, uh, of the Arba'in, uh, Arba the, the 40 hadith, of his 40 hadith, he says, but I have collected 40 hadith which are more important than those and much more comprehensive. He says, each of these 40 hadith that I have given in my book is a qa'idatun min qawaid al-deen. Oh, oh, he says, qa'idatun azimatun. It's one of the, mo the tremendous principles. It's, one of the, uh, it's a tremendous principle of fundamental from the fundamentals of the religion. About which he says the scholars will say this particular hadith constitutes one third of the religion. This particular hadith is equivalent to one half of the religion. This particular hadith is equivalent to one quarter of the religion. And all the scholars of the past, Imam Ahmed, Imam Shafi'i, and those scholars like them who said about certain hadith, Imam Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood, Rahmatullah Sahib al-Sunan, the one who wrote Sunan Abu Dawood, student of Imam Ahmed. Uh, Abu Dawood died in the era about 75, uh, 279, 275. He says, for my Sunan Abu Dawood, I accessed over... Um, 400,000 hadiths and I whittled them down to about 4,800 for my Sunan collection and out of those 4,800 four would suffice a Muslim for his life he doesn't mean it literally four will suffice but these four are like really the whole of Islam is contained in these four and they spring from these four and all the four that he mentions are 
in Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith. Imam Ahmad would say the religion is based upon three hadiths. And we'll come to what he says later. And the three are in the 40 hadith. Imam Shafi says, uh, 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 Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak says, the religion ha uh, has five hadith or some, four or five hadith as foundational. The ones that he mentioned are in here. And that's why the scholars say, for its barakah, for its useful blessings, for its usefulness, for its God-given power to attach us in a strong way to the sunnah of the Prophet and to the principles of the religion, scholars urge that let it be read even by lay people. And if they can even hear a mild commentary about it, just plucking out a few gems, a few treasure troves, then subhanAllah, it will be more valuable to them than all that they have of material wealth. Because unfortunately the nature of the lay person is that she or he takes material wealth and, and, and uh, uh, non-sacred learning and gives that more priority than sacred learning. And the level of ignorance that there is amongst the lay people today is incredible. It's just incredible. Okay. And that's just not befitting for Muslims to be in a situation of so much ignorance. We don't all have to be ulama or scholars, absolutely not. That's a task which is taxing upon most human beings. And Allah, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah doesn't burden the soul with more than it can bear. But we need to be primed with sufficient religious knowledge. We need to be armed with how to grow our souls and our spirits and our bodies in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for that reason, uh, just learning a little bit of religion and religious reminder on a regular basis, it, subhanAllah. One of my sheikhs told me many years ago, he said to a group of us, he said, if you just read a tafsir of, of uh, a commentary, scholarly commentary of one or two verses a day, which wouldn't take you more than 10, 15 minutes probably, okay. Then since there are only about six and a half thousand verses in the Quran, okay, and you did two verses a day, that's three and a half thousand, uh, uh, you know, that's three and a half thousand days, 3,500 days, okay, and there's 365 days in the year, that just within 10 years, you would have thoroughly read a serious tafsir or two. 10 years, mashallah. Some of us, for 10 years or 20 years, we've been watching EastEnders and we know the story and the script. Okay? Some of us, for it, sounds, it seems like 200 years, have been watching Bollywood movies since, you know, the black and white times, okay, and can remember every second song that, you know, Muhammad Rafi or Lata Mangeshka, whoever the crew and crowd is or was, has done. But we don't, we're not able to devote that time. You can see where I'm going with this. And of course, that is just humiliation for ourselves. And let's not, let's not twist it on its head by saying, oh, but doesn't, Islam doesn't tell me to remember Allah 24 hours a day, that, because that's not what's being said. But it is interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran that work for the hereafter and do not forget your portion of the dunya. Work for the akhirah, but don't forget your portion of the dunya. Allah didn't say the other way around. Work for the dunya, but don't forget the hereafter. Allah says, work for the hereafter, but don't neglect your dunya. Don't forget it. And we live the opposite of the verse. When Allah says to us, a dua, why don't you, why don't you say this dua? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhaab al Oh, our Lord, give us good in this world. Fi dunya. Give us good in the hereafter. Wa qina adhaab al But save us from the blazing fire. It's telling us, it's good to have good in this world. And there's no harm in it. Ask, and you should be given, inshallah. But, and give me good in the hereafter. Don't forget that. And what is the greater goal? Save me from the fire. It's spiritual. It's akhirah. It's ukhrawiyah, not dunawiyah. It's hereafter, not the here and now. 
So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to pick up 40 hadith, and hopefully uh, some hadith we'll just spend one, uh, you know, one session on, and some hadith, uh, some, one, you know, some sessions we can do one or two hadith together. But today we'll do one hadith, because I've done a small introduction. So Imam Nawawi, Matan of uh, Arba'in Nawawiya, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. There are various translations. This is one of the oldest in English. It's probably the best. You can get it in various shops at you know, various prices and whatever, inshallah. So it'd be nice if we had the honor and the adab uh, to, uh, to actually go to the shop and, or online, purchase it, and then bring it every time. So I can just follow the Arabic so that at least I can have adab towards the ilm, the knowledge that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me. Okay? Not because I have to have the book, not because I have to take notes, because this is not, um, you know, this is not a, a class of tulab al-ilm, you know, the kind of uh, academic seekers of religious knowledge. Um, that would require some sense of Arabic as a, as a, as a, as a, as a foundation. But nevertheless, we want to be intelligent Muslims, those who are informed by revelation, those who are taking seriously the gift of aql that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the gift of, of thinking and, and intelligence, and to put it to use vis-a-vis -vis revelation is primarily what aql was created for. Because aql, from the word Arabic word iqal, or the Egyptians will say iqal, the iqal would be what Bedouin Arabs, and some, you still see it now, you know the Saudi national headdress or the Kuwaiti national headdress? They've got the, their turban thing, and then they've got this black band. All right, okay. Even just 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, let alone hundreds and hundreds of years ago, when there were nomadic Arabs, Bedouin Arabs, okay, the iqal would actually be a lasso or a hoop. If you wanted to tie down a camel, tie its legs, or you're going to slaughter a sheep, and you want, didn't want it to bolt, you'd use the iqal, okay, the iqal, which is not a headdress, which was actually a, a piece of rope or a lasso, and it's just convenient that I can stick it on my head. You know, you don't want to be carrying it around, and you've got your, your sword here, and you've got your arrow there, and you've got various other bits and pieces, okay, and it's like, oh, where can I put my iqal? And just sling it over your shoulder, but hey, it fits on the head quite well, okay? And the, the iqal would you be used to tie down the creature. So the iqal is now used to tie down the, the, the turban, okay, at least in, in show, but it had a more uh, utilitarian, practical use uh, in life. And the word aql comes from iqal because aql ties, helps tie things down for us. It helps, tie, it helps to tie truths down, and it helps to tie down the consequences of actions. If I put my hand, God forbid, in a blazing fire, and no one's told me anything about fire, okay, I might have done it the first time and scolded myself for, you know, and I've got kind of a heat burn for about four days. But the akal will help tie down that intelligent understanding that, Abu Ali, don't do a stupid thing like that again. Akal will help me deal with consequences. And the one who is aware of consequences, especially bad consequences, and so keeps away, and is aware of good consequences, so he moves forward to them, he is an aqil, the one who is intelligent. So the one who obeys God and keeps away from disobedience of God is an aqil, but the, is an intelligent person, according to the Quranic worldview. But the one who sins, disobeys God, by not praying, or not fasting, or backbiting, or not giving zakat, or taking the right of inheritance that belongs to uh, one of the brothers or sisters for himself or herself, that person is not an aqil, that person is, ja the Quran itself says, is jahil, is ignorant. They may be a PhD holder, they may be, you know, um, Stephen Hawking's his best friend in astrophysics or theoretical physics, but they are jahil, they are ignorant, because they don't understand the consequences of realities. They understand maybe some superficial co consequences. If I don't get to the Christmas sales on time at Harrods, I'm not going to get that bargain coat, but that's a superficial consequence. But the real deeper consequences, we haven't quite thought about. 
Okay. So, inshallah ta'ala, what we'll do is I'll read the hadith and then make some comments and then let's see what can come out in question and answers. And uh, just for the sake of kind of adab, I'll read the Arabic because it's not much. And it's, even if we don't understand Arabic, it, there'll be a point of barakah, of blessings, inshallah. We'll read the names of at least one person, okay? Uh, one righteous person. It'll be a sahabi in this case, okay? Companion. And uh, the ulama, the scholars say from ancient times, in the dhikr salihin tanzilu rahman. With the mention of the righteous, mercy descends. Rahma descends, okay? So Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi writes in the Arba'in Nawawiyah, he says, قال, عن عمير المؤمنين عبي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل مري ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته للدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكهها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه رواه إمام المحدثين أبو عبد أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم بن مغيرة بن برد بردزبا البخاري والأبو وأبو وأبو الحسين مسلم بن الحجاج بن مسلم القشيري النيسابوري في صحيحهما للذين هما أصح الكتب المصنفة on the authority of the commander of the faithful, the leader of the believers, Abu Hafs Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, I heard the messenger of Allah, the blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, actions are but by intentions, and every man shall have that which he intended. Thus, he whose migration was for Allah and his messenger, his migration was for Allah and his messenger. But he whose migration was to achieve some worldly benefit or to take some woman in marriage, then his migration, his hijra, was that was for that for which he migrated. It was related by the two imams of the scholars of hadith, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim al-Mughira al-Bardizba al-Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, and Abu Hussein Muslim ibn al-Hajjab ibn Muslim al-Qushayri an Naysaburi, Imam Muslim, in their two sahihs, which are the soundest of the compiled books. Which are the soundest of the compiled books. So An Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, is a title that Umar anhu took when he became caliph. And the reason why he took that title, leader of the believers, is because he was the political figurehead uh, and the religious figurehead of the believers. But the reason why he took it is because he didn't want the title that Abu Bakr anhu had, which was fitting for Abu Bakr, but Umar didn't feel that it was fitting for him. Anhu. Abu Bakr succeeded the Prophet <coughs> There are indications in the Sunnah from the Prophet himself that in my absence, go to Abu Bakr. <coughs> And so Abu Bakr succeeded the Prophet Sallallahu and took that kind of political authority as well as religious authority. And the word succeed in Arabic is khalafa, yukhlifu, to come after. Okay, so Abu Bakr became Khalifa to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu And that's a huge thing. Here is khayru khalqillah, the best of God's creation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here is Khatam al nabiyin the seal of the prophets. Okay, here is, here is the person for whom n n the, the gates of paradise will be opened for no one before the Prophet Sallallahu Here is the person who has the greatest intercession with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yawm al -Qiyam. And here is a non-prophet who is actually given the title by the Muslims, Khalifa to Rasulullah Sallallahu the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, and Umar al thought, you know, I can't be the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu even if there is just one step, because that's just too big. It's just, just not right. He was deserving. So he came up with Amirul Mu'mineen, leader of the believers. Abu Hafs, because he has a little daughter called Hafsa, and it's, the, it's not the Sunnah. Even though uh, many people call me Abu Alia, even though my name is Sarkhil, and it, this goes back to 20 years ago when some of my teachers from, from the Arab world, they would do the Arab thing, and then they would call you by your eldest child's name, normally male child, but in this case I had a, few, you know, I had, I had a daughter, so they called me Abu Alia. But it's not a sunnah, it's a culture of the Arabs. 
And for an Indian person or a Pakistani person to start using an Arab convention, okay, once you no, because Islam is not an Arab is Islam is not an Arabic thing. The language is Arabic, okay. The process was definitely Arabic, and the Kaaba is in the Arabian Peninsula. But Islam is universal. It did, it's not there to Arabicize things, except a few things which has to stay Arabic. Okay, we're not expected to eat Arabic food or dress in an Arabic garb, except that which has been established to be the sun. Okay. Likewise, uh, Abu Alia, uh, had I known 25 years ago, then I would have just stuck with the normal way, which is Sarkhil. Okay, uh, however it stuck. Abu Hafs is because his daughter is Hafsa radiallahu uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, and he says, the Prophet sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا الْأَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Actions are by intentions. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِينَ مَا نَوَىٰ And every person will have that which they intended. Actions are by niyat. Niya, which is the singular of niyat, we translate in English as intention. Okay? Intention. Intention in English, I intend to do this, means I've resolved in my heart to do that. I've made it my goal, my objective, my purpose. So all of these words, goal, objective, purpose, they're synonymous or equivalent with the word niya or intention. In Arabic you have niya, you have the word uh, qast, and they're one and the same. Actions are by intentions. And every person will have that which they intended. Here the Prophet is telling us the acts that we do as Muslims <clears throat> then their correctness or incorrectness, their rightness or wrongness, their um, religiousness or unreligiousness, their acceptance or rejection will be based upon one's intention of the heart. <inaudible> and whatever intention I had for that action, then that's what I'm going to get. Example. This is my example. Someone comes to this masjid and they come to the masjid because they heard there is a circle of knowledge and they remember at the back of their mind that religious knowledge is so important in Islam. And in fact, the Prophet said, whoever treads a path in order to seek knowledge, Allah will smooth for him a path to paradise. I thought, subhanAllah, smoothing the path to Jannah through just attending a circle of knowledge. Or another person remembers some hadith and says, yeah, you know, the angels come down in the gatherings of knowledge of ilm. Okay, and they actually climb on each other's backs and shelter the people in the in this gathering with their wings and mercy descends. So, subhanAllah, better than watching what's on channel four, okay, and comes to get that reward. And then another one comes because learning knowledge is an ob obligatory and I don't want to be ignorant of some basic things. So he comes for that reason. He's not aware so much of the rewards or maybe he's that's in the background but he wants to just lift ignorance from himself subhanallah compare that intention or those intentions to someone who you know it's it's minus what well, according to my phone it's minus one degrees outside or zero degrees outside it's really cold and everything else around here apart from the tube station is shut <laughs> and somehow i feel a glow from this place which is a mosque and I'm a Muslim, so it's kind of, it's not so bad, you know, it's not, it's not like I've got a, you know, a Sikh turban on, I come in here, it's gonna, I'm going to feel a bit uncomfortable. I'm going to come in here, someone's bound to have seen me in Jummah somewhere, but I'm only coming here because it's cold. And then, oh, everyone's gathering here, notices the tea, which is always a good puller. So he comes tea and thinks, okay, I'm here now, so let's just hear what this person's got to say. His intention, not haram, it's not haram not to come to the mosque. It's not haram not to come to a circle. It's not haram to... But his intention of being in the mosque is not like the intention of the other three people. The other three people will get rewarded so much so. Their deeds are amal saleh, righteous deeds. They'll get so much blessing. Allah would have drawn them closer to himself so much. This other person, what he'll get is warmth and a cup of tea. Allah in his mercy may stir his heart to think, you know what, I should come here with the right intention next week and regularly. That would be a bonus. He would have just done himself a worldly favour, which is not get frostbite. 
and have some tea. Okay? But he would not have got the intention of those. But Allah's mercy is so much that, because you know, you know, even a generous man, a generous man says, you three, you come around my house, you know, and we'll have dinner for four, four of us. But come the day, Abu Hussein, one of the three, he brings another person. But if I'm really a generous person, I say, no problem, Abu Hussein. He'll do the other, the sunnah, which is Abu Alia. I have an extra person with me who is not invited. Do I have permission to bring him in? Okay, he won't be bare adbi as they say in Urdu and just bring him in because that's a khilaf of sunnah, that's against the sunnah. He'll ask first. And if I'm a generous person, I say, oh, food for four is food for five. Or if it wasn't food for five because we're just hungry men, right, we'll make something quickly, okay, or order. Okay, meaning the, my form, four man dawat can easily extend to five or six people because I'm a generous person. Allah is Kareem, the generous of the generous, Al, Al Kareem. Even that man who just came in for a cup of tea, there are untold blessings that he could be receiving, but not because of his intention. Though. Actions are by intentions, every man will get what he intended. He will get extra things from the fadl of Allah, from the grace of Allah, because Allah is kareem, but not because of his intention. Okay? Actions are by intention. And the Prophet does the obvious thing. Uh, and the thing, not obviously, the thing of a good teacher. He gives a really nice example, and I've just given you a lead up to that example. Actions are by intentions, and every person will have that which they intended. So whoever migrates, who's ever hijrah, migration, for what's for Allah and his messenger, referring to the oppressed Muslims in Makkah, migrating to the safety of Medina, okay, um, in the time of the process. Whoever's migration was for Allah and his messenger, his migration is for Allah and his messenger. And that's what they'll get rewarded for, for <laughs> migrating for Allah's sake. But whoever's migration was, some, was for some worldly matter, or to take a woman, uh, or, or to marry a woman, then their migration is what they did, what they migrated for. And it is said, not it is said, it's a sound narration, that <clears throat> there was a man, and he wanted to marry this woman. And her name was Umm Qais. And Umm Qais says to this man, that I won't marry you unless you migrate. Because I'm migrating as well. And so the man wasn't going to migrate, but he thought, I want to marry Umm Qais. Okay, women can have that effect on, on men. Right? And so he, you know, because it's not easy migrating. I mean, it's just like leaving everything and then just uprooting. But he does it. Okay, and so Ibn Masood says, we the Muslims, we gave him the name Muhajir Um Qais, the one who migrated only for Um Qais, and Um Qais married him. Now some scholars say, this is the reason why the Prophet said, But according to the soundest position of the scholars, though that narration, that incident is true, it was not linked to the actual words of the Prophet It can apply, no doubt at all, you can see the connection, but that wasn't the reason, that wasn't the sabab al the reason why the Prophet said these words. But no doubt at all they, they apply. Okay? Um, so now a few things to, to really get into uh, a little bit of nitty gritty. We've looked at the outlines, we've got an idea. Let's look at something a, a little bit uh, in detail, inshallah. Well, first about this hadith itself. It's the very first hadith Imam Bukhari records in his Sahih al-Bukhari. Because one of his teachers, Ali ibn al-Madini said, if I ever were to compose a book, I would start it with the hadith, إِنَّمَا al amalu bin niyat actions are by intentions, just as a reminder to myself what is the intention with which I'm writing or collecting, or writing this book or collecting these hadiths in this book? And Imam Bukhari, decades later, when he comes to writing Sahih Bukhari, he does exactly that. He makes Innam al Amalu bin Niyyah, the first hadith, a way of telling himself, I need to make my intention clear, the way of telling the reader, what are you reading these hadiths, these words of the Prophet for? For spiritual growth and connecting to Allah? Or argumentation, or showing what, what are you reading for? Innamal amalu bin niyat. 
So that's one thing. The greatness of this hadith is such that Bukhari puts it right at the beginning of his Sahih. Um, Imam Shafi says, Had al hadith thulthul ilm. This hadith alone is one third of all religious knowledge. Meaning, religious knowledge, one third of it goes back to the issue of intentions. One third of religious knowledge goes back to the issue of intentions. Okay? And Imam Ahmad says, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Innahu ahadul ahadith al arba'a yaduru alayhi al Islam. This is one of the four hadiths around which the whole religion revolves, around which the whole religion turns. Okay? Niya. We said it's qasdu fil qalb. It's an intention, uh, a goal in the heart, an intention in the heart. Religiously, when we're talking about niya in Islamic terms, it's al qasdu lil amal taqarrabun ilallah. It is the intention in the heart to do an act to draw close to Allah. If a, if a sheikh or a scholar a religious person gives a religious lecture and his intention in giving religious lecture is not primarily lil'amal taqarrabun ilallah to draw closer to Allah but his intention is maybe to get paid primarily not that my intention is for Allah and I know I'll get paid at the end of salary let's say if I'm employed no, my intention is to get paid or my intention is for people to speak really good about me or my intent then the then that deed, Allah doesn't accept that deed. And the person has fallen in the eye, in the estimation of Allah SWT. And actually, he has thrown himself into sin, into disobedience. And it's one of the worst types of disobedience. Okay? He's fallen into that sin called riya. Showing off, ostentation. And Riyah is considered to be one of the three or four root major diseases of the heart. One of the major mortal sins of the heart. Along with arrogance, envy, uh, vanity, then Riyah or showing off is the first of the four they generally say. There are other diseases but they all spirit root, they all stem from these four. Okay. And niya in our religious vocabulary has two uh, areas. There is a niya, an intention, which is there, they call, they call it niyatul amal. It is uh, an intention to differentiate various types of actions. So we need a niya, innam al amalu bin niyat, tells me it's an obligation for me to have a correct and sound intention for Allah when I do the prayer. I'm praying for, uh, for the sake of Allah. But there are types of prayers. There is the fard prayer. And then there is the non-fard prayer, the sunnah prayers, the nafil prayers. I need to be careful. I need to be clear in my intention what prayer I'm praying. Is it the fard prayer or is it a sunnah prayer? Is it the maghrib prayer or is it the asr prayer? Especially in winter when they're so close together. So, niyatul amal is, it's an obligation upon me to disting, distinguish in my heart the act and what type of act. Okay? I'm now not eating, let's just say Ramadan was in winter time, as it was some years back. Right? And it's like, so we break our fast at four o'clock. So it's like missing an afternoon meal. Many people who are at work... Some students, I dare say, but many people are at work. They do that regularly. They miss an afternoon meal and they only eat when they get home because their work is so hectic and, and, and busy. So now I'm at work in Ramadan and I'm you know, one of those busy professional careers and I don't eat until well after Maghrib. But my abstain, and, and remember, uh, Fajr will come in at around about 7 o'clock, so I could have eaten up until about 6.30, 6.40 maybe, let's just say. But I'm doing that anyway because I leave the house at 6 o'clock in the morning anyway to get to work for, just say, 8.30. So I haven't eaten, and that's my daily habit. That coincides with what we do in Ramadan. But did I have the intention to fast? Of course, the Hanafis say that you make the clear intention at the uh, beginning of the month, and it suffices for the whole month. But the Hanbalis and the Shafis in insist that it has to be for every day before the, uh, before the night starts. Precisely because you can get yourself in this dilemma. 
that you know you're working and you don't realize so that's near to amal and that's what we find discussed in the books of fiqh but push that aside the books of islamic law and push aside the idea that we have to have an intention for our acts of worship because they are worship and we have to direct them to allah my charity ramadan every masjid in in the universe is collecting for extension right and it's ramadan and whatever okay and the call is made who will give a hundred pounds who will give a thousand pounds but what is my intention to just show everybody like, Abu Ali, he's, always, he's a generous character isn't he and then by the time you write it down I feel very chuffed about it definitely some people are going to talk about my generosity then Alhamdulillah the masjid benefited with the thousand pounds but it was no, I got no ajr for it. I got no reward for it. Actions by intention. The money that was supposed to be given for the sake of Allah, for the benefit of the mosque, benefited the mosque, but it wasn't given for the sake of Allah. It becomes a sin on me because of showing off, God forbid. And showing off is a major sin. The many hadith, but we'll come to that in a minute after I just explain the, 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 the outlines. The second type of niyyah, niyyatul amal, that's a fiqhi thing, dis, uh, differentiating between one act of worship and another. Then there's niyyatul ma'mool. The intention to do the act, but for whose sake? For whose sake did I do the act? That niyyatul ma'mool, the intention, for, for who did I do the act for? Who did I intend the act for? That is what we call in, uh, in Arabic or the religion as ikhlas. It's related to the word sincerity, ikhlas. And this is the topic that is dealt with in the books of Tazkiyah and Suluk and Tasawwuf, the matters that, spiritual matters of the heart. And it is the greater matter of the two. It is the greater emphasis of intention. The first intention is telling it's an obligation to have the right intention for the sake of Allah for an act to become acceptable. And though there is a diff slightly small juristic difference, whether it's ablution, whether it's prayer, whether it's fasting, whether it's pilgrimage, whether it's zakat, I have to have the intention to do it for the sake of Allah and not for anything or anyone else. Under the for the sake of Allah, it can have some subdivisions. I want to learn knowledge for the sake of Allah, but also remove ignorance of myself. Also be able to spread the truth of Islam. But that's all under the sake of Allah. And some, you can take those individual things. I want to lift ignorance of myself. And it can be not for the sake of Allah. Then it becomes wrong. But if it's put under the title of for the sake of Allah, then that becomes a, definitely not a problem. A sub niya, a subclass of niya, which is fine. Okay. <coughs> so the issue of... Uh, the niyyah, the ikhlas, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah lillahi dinul khalis, shouldn't the religion be purely and sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So what is sincerity? Let's just, because we, it's a word, we say sincerity in, in English, but what does it kind of really mean, truly in the Arabic language, truly in the religious vocabulary of Islam? Well, let's, let's turn to a few things. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسِكِ وَمَحْيَاءِ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, we've been ordered to say, my prayer and my sacrifice, my living and my dying are all for Allah, Lord of the Worlds. This is not just telling us to make your prayer and your fasting and your pilgrimage and your, uh, your, your zakat for Allah. It's saying, make your whole life for Allah. Make your whole life for Allah. And this is why spiritual teachers will tell us, just make your niyyah for Allah in everything. Not just in the things that you categorically have to do it in as a must, as a wajib, as a fun, like prayer and fasting and zakat, but even in things like uh, eating, drinking, sleeping, marrying, buying a car, studying, my vocation or profession. To make it for Allah. Why? Because say my living, my dying are all for Allah. That's the way, that's the aim of the believer. Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu says in a sound hadith ثلاث لا يغل عليهن قلب مسلم 
There are three things that will prevent the heart of a Muslim from being unfaithful or for being for harboring ill will. The word ghil means ill will. Okay, rancor or hatred. But here we can broaden it to be an unfaithful. Not unfaithful as in lack of iman. You know, when they say oh, uh, the husband has been unfaithful to the wife. Or you have broken your promise to me, so you have been unfaithful. A betrayal of trust. So ghil here is closer to betrayal of trust than it is uh, ill will. There are three things that prevent the heart of a Muslim from unfaithfulness. Ikhlas ul amali lillah. The first one is doing an action sincerely and purely for Allah. The second one, wa mana sahatu wa al amr, and giving sound advice, sincere advice, to the one who is in charge of our affairs. It normally refers to the political leader. And the third one, luzum wa jamaat al muslimin, and clinging on to the main body of the Muslims or the community of the Muslims. The idea is, if you wanted to cling on to the community of the Muslims, you'd have to be, have a really good behavior with them and you'd have to look after their interests as you would want them to look after your interests. There'll be a level of goodness in the heart. And the more that I valued the community of Muslims, the less I would feel like betraying them or being selfish. I would, subhanAllah, I could even get to a stage in my life where I prefer their needs over my own personal needs. Uh, giving sincere advice to the, uh, to the one in authority, the, uh, the, uh, the, the walat al-amr, is, uh, or those in charge of the affair, is simply this, that if the rulers, who just have an incredible effect on the land, if they don't do good, it's going to affect me one way or the other. So just for my own personal interest, okay, if I want my affairs to go well, let me give sincere advice to those in authority. And even though it's not referring to uh, mosque committees and things like that, so referring to political leadership. But if we pull the hadith out a little bit, draw it out a bit, then we can apply to that. Oh, my masjid is not doing something that I want it to do, which will be beneficial to the community. Then there's two parts. I can go around my community, and every walima I go to, and every invitation or dawah I get invited to, we sit down, and then after, we say, oh yeah, the mosque, they're not doing that, and they're not doing this, they're not doing that. And then Abdurrahman just says to me, Abu Ali, have you kind of spoken to the mosque? Oh, no, I haven't. Well, how long have you felt like this? A year. And then Abdul Rahman realizes, I've not just complained to him, but actually I've complained to you, 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 and I haven't gone to the mosque committee. I haven't gone to you as the mosque committee. So if I really thought it was beneficial, surely, surely sincerity in me would have demanded that. I would have at least mentioned, at least dropped a letter in the mosque uh, safe. You know, I don't want to talk to the mosque committee, you're going to get on my nerves or whatever. I just drop a little letter. Tweet them. Okay, um, so, uh, so that's one way. Or the other, the simple other way is, look, you know, I'm so convinced that if we can do this project, it will be so beneficial for us and others. And I'm so sincere about it, then my sincerity will just lead me to somehow access the relevant people and say, what about this? And if I didn't convince them the first time, not a problem, because sometimes good ideas take a little bit while to sink in. Okay, sometimes good ideas are, you know, they, they're an acquired taste. Truth is generally an acquired taste, yeah? As soon as it comes, most people react sharply against it. And then it begins to filter down in the heart slowly and steadily. That's the nature of, let alone universal truths. It can happen, sub, you know, the milder truths can be like that as well. And, uh, and ikhlas, doing an action sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, once we begin to do those three things, it's very difficult for the heart to be just purposely unfaithful and treacherous and have ill will against anything or anybody. Then you begin to have a heart that is really beautiful. In Sahil Bukhari, there's a hadith in which Abdullah ibn Amr says, وَسُعِلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنْ رَجُلْ يُقَاتِلُ رِيَا وَيُقَاتِلُ شَجَاعَ وَيُقَاتِلُ حَمِيَّةً أَيُّ ذَلِكَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The Prophet was asked about a man who fights, and he fights a war, makes jihad, for the sake of showing off, for the sake of just showing his valour. And one who fights for, no, the fights for showing off. And the second one, yuqatilu shaja'a, fights for valor or bravery. And yuqatilu hamiya, he fights for tribalism. Okay, we're Indians, we do, we're Pakistanis with this, we're Saudis with this, we're Egyptians, they do this. And it's nothing to do with the truth. Or even take, take this, um, narrow it down. And I won't give an example of, of um, tribalism in Arabia because there's no Arabs here. Right? And I won't give a, an example of, of tribalism in, 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 say, West Africa or Central Africa, because there's probably one or two people who are African. Most of us can relate to a subcontinent thing. 
Here we are broken up into little factions, even in one country. Okay, so you have the Sindhis, okay, and you have the, the Karachiites, and then you have the, 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 the Punjabis or Mirpuris, and you have the Kashmiris, and you have this. And then you have some people who 40, 50, 60 years ago, whenever they migrated across the border into uh, current-day Pakistan. And yes, there are rights and wrongs, and it's really not the issue here. But no one's looking at the truth, but we're quite happy to kill Muslims. We're quite happy to kill Muslims. The first country that was established in modernity for the sake of Islam and the Muslims, and we're quite happy to kill Muslims. And what worse than that? You think, what's worse? You come to my house and I'll fan the flames with you and me to wind you up more, to hate other Muslims. So that when you do go back to that land, you're thinking, oh, oh, I remember what Abu Ali said, oh, oh, where's the nearest petrol canister? <laughs> SubhanAllah. And if you take the life of a single man, it's like you've murdered the whole of mankind. And I want to stand in front of Allah, Ya Allah, I don't have blood on my hands, I am drenched in blood. The blood of six billion human beings. 1.2 billion of them are Muslims. <laughs> Subhanallah. Hamiyyah is something which the Prophet said in the final uh, khutbah in Hajj. I've trampled it under my feet. Tribalism. Bradrism. Don't get me wrong. There's no problem being Punjabi. There's no problem being uh, Sindhi. There's no, because that's just geographical realities. As well, there's no problem being uh, Misri, Egyptian. There's no pe uh, problem being Shami, Syrian. There's no problem being whatever. That's not a problem. We have made you into tribes and groups that you may know each other, the most righteous amongst you or most pious amongst you, those who have most taqwa. The problem is when truth is judged all around the bradri, the tribal system, that is jahiliya par excellence. You ever want to see an ugly, despicable, stinking thing, you couldn't find something more stinking than the tribal system that makes its allegiances and enmity around the tribe. My tribe, right or wrong? And Islam came to wipe that out 1400 years ago. And we've come to place it back. <laughs> so don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong about countries or cities or places. And this is my nis uh, nisbah, <coughs> I am Sindhi. I am Gujarati, I am this, I am that, I am Hausa, okay, I am Mandinka. There's no problem with that, really. The problem is when I make it an issue of truth, falsehood, breaking unity or making unity. So the process I said was asked, one person fights for showing off, one person fights for just showing his bravery, one person fights just for tribalism or, use the modern word, nationalism. Which one of them fights in the path of God? The Prophet said, Man qatala The one who fights such that the word of God becomes supreme and uppermost, he fights in the path of God. And that's why in another hadith in the Muslim of Ahmed, the hadith says, Many a people, that many a martyr there is who gets martyred and he's on he gets and he gets martyred and he's one of the people of the bed. Many a martyr there is, many a shaheed there is, and they are one of the people of the bed. Meaning they die on their beds, like maybe of old age or illness, but they're martyrs. I'll come to explain why. And many a people there are in the battle ranks who get killed, and Allah knows their, what their intention was. Meaning, the person like Khalid ibn al-Walid, Sayfullah, where did he die? He didn't die in a battle. He didn't die in a battle. If he were to expose himself, his body to us, there wouldn't be a single space on his blessed body, anhu, except that it was scarred for the sake of Allah. Back and front. But he dies on his, on his bed. From the, perhaps not old age, but you know, just, just as normal people would just die. But clearly, Sayyidullah, he's a shaheed. Okay? And yet, people may have fought and outwardly 
met a martyr's death, but Allah doesn't count them as a martyr because their intention was something completely different. It was for country only. It was for wealth, it was for showing off, it was tribalism, nationalism, whatever other ism. The six day, 1967, 67 Arab war, okay, against the fledgling state of Israel. No doubt at all, there were so many people who would do it for, as Muslims, you know, for Islam. But as a whole, the umbrella was, was Nasserist socialism, was Arabism, it was Pan-Arabism. And they all got together under the Pan-Arab, well, we saw what happened with Pan-Arabism. The glory of the Arabs wasn't within Arabism, it was when Islam came to them. And if you are so thick you can't make that historical difference, then you deserve what you got. Or at least we should repent for it. So it's about niya, intention. So let me just finish by giving us uh, some flavours of the great spiritual masters of what intention or niya or ikhlas is. So let's just read. They say, faqil, ikhlas, sincerity, huwa ifradu al-haq subhanahu bil qasti fi ta'a. Ikhlas is singling out Allah Ifrad al-Haq, al-Haq meaning the real Allah. Okay, we say one of Allah's names is al-Haq, the real. It can also be trans, Haq is also truth. truth. Haq is real and truth. So Allah is the truth, the real. And the real in the sense that unless Allah willed us into existence, we wouldn't exist. But Allah definitely exists. Allah has always been, will always be. Okay, so they say in theology, in, in Aqidah, Allah is, a, a, he necessarily exists. But we, we contingently exist. Because if Allah doesn't want us into existence, just in a blink of an eye, we could be gone. If Allah didn't want the cosmos into existence, in the blink of an eye, you know, 13,000 million years, 13 billion years of unwinding the cosmic clock, we could, it could just be blinked out of, uh, willed out of existence by God. So Allah is the real in the sense that, not that we're not real, we are real. But we're only real because Allah has willed us into existence. But the real real is Allah. Okay, so ikhlas is to single out Allah the real as the objective of my obedience. So when I pray this act of obedience, I'm intending Allah, no one else. Waqil, it has been said, ikhlas, tasfiyatul fi'l an malahadatil makhluqeen. Subhanallah, this is a saying of Junaid as far as I know. Junaid al Baghdadi. Tasfiyatul fi'l, it's to purify the act. Cleanse the act and malahadatil makhluqin from any share or from creation having any share in it. Okay, so here's the act. Okay, and it's got a lot of dirt on the you just get rid of it and it's completely clean. Clean of the stain of doing it for people. That is ikhlas. Or they say qil. Ikhlas nisyanu ru'yatil khalq. Bidawami nadhari ila al khaliq. Ikhlas is to forget the existence of creation by continually gazing at the Creator. We're only thinking of Allah. When I'm doing the prayer and I'm getting ready, okay, because the, the adhan is gone, okay, let's just say it's Maghrib, so I've got about a minute or two before someone walks in and does the iqama. So, trying to get calm, whatever, for Allah. And really, I, I'm kind of not aware. And it's not my duty to see if the line is straight. That's not my duty. And in fact, I've got no time for it because I'm trying to become, have ikhlas. That duty is the imams. That's unfortunately his duty. He has to turn around and say, so, 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 show your eyes and come forward, backward, whatever. And he kind of looks at the back. He might ask one of you, is it kind of straight? Yeah. But kind of weird. We're, our main thing is khalas. You know, I'm a responsible Muslim. Hopefully everyone around me is a responsible Muslim. We're not all kids. Okay, so I just have to focus not on the outer, on the inner. And the imam will take the rest of the responsibility. That's what we put him there for, inshallah. Okay. okay. So how do I... But that's a difficult thing because, you know, this society, the world itself, it's the other way around. Keep gazing at others. Forget God. So now I, you know, 
I kind of make it a point that make sure you see me in the mosque so that you can start talking about how good I am. Okay? And I tell you all my good deeds, even the ones that I haven't done. Because right? then you can start speaking about me in a really good way. And it, it doesn't occur that Allah isn't my focus. When the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam moves away from Ikhlas at some real serious basic level, what type of barakah do we expect, even from the most generous? Because our acts aren't really for him. In the 90, at the end of the 80s, the fledgling computer industry went ballistic, the IT industry, just mashallah. I knew some Jewish friends at university and some Hindu friends. And I knew some Muslims and Christians, but I, these come in my mind. We sat down one day thinking, what are we going to do? One of the Jewish people, who I didn't really know very well, but he lived in my block, he said he wants to get into media to hopefully oppose the anti-Semitism that he feels exists in Britain. So whatever he's going to do after graduation, he wants to get into media studies, whatever. For what? Either for his, because with the Jews it's a bit different, could I, either religious, Judaism, Judaic religious, or uh, community, is, uh, Israelite community, because you, you have people who are Jews who don't believe in God, or Moses, or Sinai, okay? Um, but they're still part of the Jewish diaspora, or, you know, the Jewish thing. But point being is he was doing something, you know. And then the Hindu person, uh, he just said that he wanted to go uh, back to his parents' home, India, okay? Uh, in, in this case, southern India. And he wanted to set up something for Hindu people in, I don't know, Kerala or something like that, which is one of the most uh, literate, literate states in, 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 in India. And I thought, Alhamdulillah, if they asked me, but we didn't get around to ask me, I was already beginning to learn religion and with uh, a brother called Abu Muntasir begin to go around a few places in London giving dawah. And I knew that that's where I wanted to be and do. But what happens is, uh, come the uh, 90s, all these brothers were all kind of growing our beards and demars and we're buying these few books and whatever. So many of these brothers, especially in this IG area, this wider IG Ilford area, they went from university, penniless students, to £40,000, £50,000, £60,000 in the IT industry. You think? Wonderful. Hopefully, eight of them, ten of them, twelve of them, give it a year, we'll get a mosque in Ilford, in, in the Red Bridge area. There was no mosque in the Red Bridge area at this time. Nothing. You see some of them, their cars got real flashier. Dean, nothing. Soup kitchens, nothing. Nothing except selfishness. And for a Muslim, that's highly despicable. But where I suggest we might be still like that a little bit, we're planning only for our dunya. Here is my son, he's highly intelligent, getting to, you know, uh, get into the uh, Ivy League universities if you can't get into Cambridge or Oxford. But I won't even suggest to him, maybe your brilliant brain could be put into the deen so that you could be one of those future scholars who have a deep understanding of the Islamic tradition and a, as just a deep understanding of the Western philosophical tradition because that's what underpins modernity. And then maybe if there's few more of you, give it 20 years, 30 years, we won't, at least intellectually, we won't be in the mess that we're in. No, but it's not for sake of Allah. I'm thinking that if my son gets a really good job somewhere, then I can kind of retire at 62 and I don't trust the government with my pension now anyway and alhamdulillah I'll have an okay life. And that's halal. But do you think that's what the Prophet wanted for us? That we would be a, a nation that just sits back on our laurels and gets fat and thinks of dunya alone? So niya is really, really important. So to sum up... Um, oh, one more thing, no. For they... 
الكلام فضيل بن اياد ترك العمل من اجل الناس رياء والعمل من اجل الناس شرك والاخلاص ان يوافق الله منهما to leave an act because of people is showing off to do an act for the sake of people is shirk is associating partners with Allah sincerity is when Allah saves you from both some people say that oh you know uh Abu Ali, I was I was going to wear the hijab I was going to wear the hijab the, the headscarf but then I thought oh would I really be doing it for Allah maybe it's in, I mean sincere so I didn't do it no sister if there is an obligation just do it because it's probably shaitan whispering to you that you're you've got bad intentions and in fact doubting your intention is a good sign of doubting your sincerity is a good sign of sincerity doubting your sincerity is generally a good sign of sincerity the worry is when i think hi i'm so sincere then that's a real problem then then there's likely that we're not sincere okay I'm going to give this charity, but actually, you know, oh, brother saw me now. Oh, I was just going to put it in the box without anyone looking, the can of soup or whatever. But now I've seen, oh, I better not. No, do it. Do it. And don't doubt your sincerity. And if you doubt your sincerity, do it and say, Ya Allah, accept this from me and forgive me for being insincere. But do it. And at the same, so don't leave a good action because of, unless you're so absolutely, absolutely, absolutely clear. For example. They said to, they said to Makhul, come to us, come with us, we're going to a janazah prayer. He said, wait. And he waited and he waited. And they're waiting a few minutes, five, ten minutes. Okay, let's go. And the, one of the students asked him, what was that about? He goes, I didn't know if I was going to do it for the sake of Allah or not, so I just wanted the time to get my intention right. And this is why, as a fiqhi issue, as a legal issue, the scholars are all agreed. Niya qastu fil qalb is an intention in the heart. It is the state of a heart. It has nothing to do with the tongue. Every scholar is agreed about that. What they have a slight disagreement about, with the majority saying one thing and a minority saying it else, is can the niya, the intention, like for the prayer, be verbalized? Oh Allah. I'm standing behind the Imam, I'm going to pray three rakah maghrib. Can it be verbalized? One group of scholars and their minority say it cannot because intention is an action of the heart, not the tongue. The part of being the action of the heart is agreed upon. The issue is can it be verbalized? The majority say it's permissible to verbalize if it helps hudur al qalb, the presence of heart in prayer. Because I've rushed into the mosque, I'm a bit tired and whatever. It's like, you know, and I've been five minutes running to try to get on time, and even though I shouldn't run, okay? And like the Imam's just gone into, you know, prayer, and I'm just, and I'm not quite sure now. I could be not quite sure what prayer, and that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Of, so, Hudur al Qalbis, I just walked to the prayer. The Prophet said, if any one of you is uh, going to the prayer, let him not race, but let him walk calmly with dignity, and whatever he catches, he catches, whatever he misses, he makes up. The reason why is because then you're in a state of dignity, calmness and serenity. You know what you're doing, who you're doing it for. So we're coming to prayer. Oh. But if we couldn't and we needed words to help us, oh, this is two rakah, four rakah I'm praying of, of the Dhuhr prayer. But having formulaic niyas, you say this thing in Arabic as a non-Arabic speaking person and it's four lines long and you have no idea what you're saying defeats the point. It's just become a rasm, a, 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 a piece of custom which has lost its, its spirit. Okay, so the majority do so, it's permissible uh, if it helps presence of heart. And that's the same with the Prophet kept his eyes open in prayer. And some of our Salaf didn't like closing the eyes in prayer because the Sunnah was to keep it open. However, however, it's possible that when I... Uh, if I close my eyes, I can help focus myself. Then it should be, it is permitted to close your eyes to help focus yourself, but somewhere in the prayer, open up the eyes again with focus so that we can combine both sunnahs. The, fo the sunnah of being inwardly focused on Allah and the sunnah of actually seeing the place of prostration 
with your eyes open. But if it requires me just for the first part of the prayer, for the first 10 seconds, for the first minute, closing my eyes or whatever, do so. But don't go for praying the whole prayer with eyes closed. And then that is the goal. It's not a goal. It's a, dare I say, technique to bring the heart to be present with standing in front of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Focus. So with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, innamal amalu bin niyat, actions are by intention. I leave with this hadith. The Prophet said that Allah says, Ana aghna shuraka'i anish shirk. I am so self-sufficient. I am so self-sufficient. I am so ghani. I have no need of partners being set up with me. Man amila amalan ashraka fihi ghayri. So whoever does an action that should have been for me but for someone else's sake. Fahuwa lilladhi ashraka bihi wa ana minhu bari. Then that action will be rejected by me for the one who, you asso who he associated as partners with me. We need Allah's acceptance of our actions by asking him to make us sincere sincerity re requires us focusing on Allah forgetting about other people so to speak and if we can then even make our mundane acts as the Prophet said even the food that one of you puts in the mouth of his wife you'll get rewarded for meaning even our mundane acts if we can do them for the sake of Allah Allah will turn that daily mundane act, which is not an act of ibadah in itself. Sleeping is not an act of worship, like prayer. Eating is not an act of worship, like prayer. But if I have it for the sake of Allah, Ya Allah, I want to eat this food, halal, to thank you, and to give me strength to worship you, that f eating food becomes an ibadah, an act of worship. And that is why you'll see the difference between Allah's awliya, those who are close to Allah in faith, piety and obedience and the likes of us because even mundane things they say about Shaykh Abdul Rahman Shaghuri one of the great Syrian uh, saints of recent times only of recent times who passed away ta'ala, that regularly, nearly every day after a particular time in the market, in Damascus marketplace he would go to this particular stall and he'd buy up all the remaining bad apples that were left on this poor man's stall and that would happen every day because people would take the best apples, obviously, and buy the best apples. And you're left with kind of bad apples that no one wants. And then, you know, five days out of seven, let's just say, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Shahori would come in and buy these apples. And it's been on for years, like 10, 15 years. And so one day someone plucked up enough courage to say, you know, yeah, Sheikh, what do you do with these apples? You know, do you, what do you do? You make apple juice or what? He goes, no, you know. Um, I, many years ago I saw this man struggling and I knew this man had come from a good uh, dignified family and I didn't want to just give him charity and belittle the man's self-worth so I thought what can I do so one day it just Allah inspired me look whatever is in his cart just buy it up and it happened to be bad apples and then the following days that's what I saw and it just became a habit so I take them and then I give it to some of my animals and some of the people that are farmers and some here 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 and I don't tell him SubhanAllah, you do that consistently. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that niyyah makes that buying apples into an act of worship. Buying apples, SubhanAllah, into an act of worship. So Allah doesn't limit his accessibility to just a mosque. We can become close to Allah in every pathway of this world. The street sweeper, he says, Alhamdulillah, Ashkur Allah, forgive me, halal job. And he's doing this, he's saying, Ya Allah, I do this with the knee of uh, making society good because you're sweeping away rubbish. It's a menial task. He didn't go to Cambridge for it. And if he comes to my daughter, I'm not going to give him my daughter's hand marriage. Street sweeper, how dare. But this man is connected with Allah in a way that that Cambridge PhD qualified Muslim who barely prays once a week, he has hardly any connection with God for all of his academic sophistry. But it can only become like that when we know how to see with the light of Allah. And the Prophet said in his khutbahs, Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqan. 
ورزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه او الله uh, make me see the truth for what it truly is for what it really is and cause me to follow it and show me falsehood for what falsehood really is and keep me away from it we no longer see the bath in the inward things we only see the zahir he's got a phd from cambridge he's going to be good for my daughter and my grandchildren but actually that person who doesn't pray and now your grandchildren are six or seven and they see daddy doesn't pray and you're telling them as da da daddy oh namaz prayer is really important they say daddy daddy nanny uh, granddad grandma really nice aren't they talk about prayer but it can't be that important because god dad doesn't pray and dad was important dad would pray but that street sweeper who i was so arrogant to deny the bible will say uh that the um that the uh, the, the stone that the builder refused becomes the head corner stone the stone that you think ah oh, it's not actually it becomes the stone in which and really we have that already because look, what what did the quraysh do the quraysh one of the reasons that they didn't accept this, the, the the messengership of the prophet is awesome, not because he was an arab he was arab not because he wasn't makkan he was makkan not because he wasn't quraysh he was quraysh not because he wasn't hashmi the best of the quraysh he was banu hashim but he was fatherless and therefore penniless how can god have sent a messenger not so much from the tri tribe because he's on the right tribe but he's not from the wealthy ones the stone that the builder refused became the head corner stone of the whole world and he saw aslam said oh allah raise me up with the masakin with the poor people and he saw aslam said the poor will enter paradise 50000 years before the rich and today i have arrogance against the poor oh yes i will send my check and whatever but i'm arrogant a poor person asks me yes i am worried about how he's going to provide for my daughter but the man is got a halal job piety good character subhanallah there are angels around him if only i could see and that one who i can boast to you all <coughs> the only true friend he has whether he realizes or not is iblis and iblis comes to my house because we don't have the niyyah and we don't see the sur beneath the surface of things we only see a zahir not batin we see with one eye we don't have two eyes perspective and the creature that is known to see with one eye is who the jaw and when you see with one eye i mean just physically forget you know one thing is everything becomes out of depth out of perspective when things are out of perspective you miss the picture we muslims don't have to be like that but we are seeing out of perspective from top to bottom inna ma la'malu bin niyat wa inna ma li kulli min ma nawa fa man kana hijratu ila allah wa rasuli fa hijratu ila allah wa rasuli wa man kana hijratu li dunya yusibaha aw imra'atin an yankihu fa hijratu ila ma hajara ilayh that was the first hadith of imam nawawi actually about by intention that every man would have that which he intended whoever migrated for allah and his messenger his migration was for allah and his messenger whoever migrated for some worldly reason or to marry a woman his migration was for that reason and not the religious reason we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq which is akhu wa khayr wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam um what we'll do is we'll we'll pick up questions on the second sitting inshallah ta'ala barakallahu fiikum